All right, welcome. Uh, this presentation is titled Forest Farming 101, an introduction to growing and marketing non-timber forest products. Uh, this is the first presentation uh, for the Train the Trainer uh, webinar series um, hosted by the West Virginia Forest Farming Initiative. My name is Tanner Filia. I work with Rural Action Sustainable Forestry Program, uh, who is one of the uh, active partners uh, with the WVFFI. A uh, couple goals for this presentation today. Um, you know, the main takeaways that we want to come with, come away with at the end of the uh, presentation uh, are going to be a understanding of you know what non-timber forest products are. You know, what are the basic concepts of forest farming? Um, we're going to do an overview of the forest farming production methods. Um, and then we're gonna talk about um, some basics of marketing non-timber forest products and some considerations um, that can be helpful to your landowner clients when you're providing them with assistance. So first we're gonna kind of talk about some basics of forest farming. You know, what is forest farming? What are non-timber forest products? Um, you know, non-timber forest products can be a lot of different things. It's a whole suite of uh, products that could be, you know, decorative and craft products, edible plants, medicinal plants. Um, you know, today we're trying to think a lot about forest farming and, you know, typically we'll be talking a lot about the medicinal plant species um, that I have listed here. Um, you'll hear a lot about, you know, ginseng, golden seal, black cohosh, uh, ramps, which we have pictured here on this uh, slide, and a, a variety of other species as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, decorative and craft products are are a big part of non-timber forest product markets, um, but they tend to be more uh, have more of a heavily in heavy influence in the Western non-timber forest products industry. Uh, you know, some of the products that are typically found here in the Eastern deciduous forest um, would be more common down in the Southern Appalachians or in the mountains. Um, you have galax, pine boughs, fern fronds, things like that. Um, with more wide distribution, you tend to get your edible and medicinal species. Um, so certainly ramps, um, tree syrups like maple syrup or black walnut syrup, birch syrup are all uh, popular products. Uh, cultivated mushrooms like shiitake or lion's mane, um, you know, depending on where you're at, what, which state you're in, you know, you might be uh, able to forage and sell wild mushrooms like morels or chanterelles as well. Um, and of course, you know, the, the medicinal plants tend to get the, get the top billing and tend to be the most popular and some of the more valuable species, uh, particularly ginseng and golden seal. So, you know, what is forest farming? You know, forest farming is, uh, you know, basically just using a natural or modified forest habitat to support the growth of one or more desired species. Um, you know, here in this picture, we obviously have a lot of ramps that are coming up here in the early springtime. Um, you know, but there are a lot of other plant species uh, in this mix as well that, that aren't quite up yet at this point in the growing season. Um, so it's a mixed polyculture at, at its core, you know, a diversity of species rather than a, a big monoculture that helps maintain diversity and provides us with other benefits as well. And we'll kind of touch on some of those uh, later in the present presentation. Um, you know, forest farming systems can can be very small or very large. You know, they can they can be very uh, low input or they can be very high input. So that scale and intensity of production uh, really varies based on the goals of the landowner and the suitability of the landscape, um, you know, and the forest quality. Um, but at its core, you know, forest farming is supposed to be a more long-term endeavor, you know, thinking about growing a lot of these plant species on the order of, you know, 10, 15, you know, 20, 30 years. And, you know, it should be sustainable and regenerative. You know, you want, to basically always be putting something back and not just extracting, uh, you know, raw materials from the forest, you know, I mean, that's at its core, that's a core principle of forest farming is, is sustainability. 
forest farming has a lot of different benefits. Um, you know, a lot of people are interested in making supplemental income from their forest land. Uh, Non-timber forest products and forest farming can be a good way for uh, landowners to do that. Um, you know, most of these species can be, you know, planted, harvested, and replanted repeatedly on a growing site. Um, so thinking about that long-term kind of uh, production cycle. Um, all these species are generally that we're talking about today. Um, the forest botanical medicinal species are shade obligate. You know, they need a good shade from the forest overstory to, to thrive and, and really do well. So, you know, it, forest farming at its core, you know, requires an intact forest canopy and over the long term incentivizes uh, forest retention. Um, you know, the older the forest, the better, typically. You have better, uh, better soil conditions, um, you know, better habitat and older forests. So it definitely encourages uh, retention of, of older, more mature forests. Can it definitely help enhance and support biodiversity? So, um, you know, past land use affects, you know, vegetation, vegetation patterns in our forests. Um, quite significantly. So forest farming can, can be a way to reintroduce these species to the landscape where the habitat is suitable. Um, you know, so for species that are potentially threatened, you know, or endangered like ginseng or golden seal um, that have been over harvested uh, throughout much of their native range, this can be an easy way to, uh, you know, introduce them back into the forest landscape and, and re-naturalize. And ultimately, you know, if you're successful at forest farming, um, you know, by putting these cultivated materials into the market, we're helping to reduce the pressure on wild populations. You know, much of the market for these products is still supplied by wild harvesting, and that has had a significant impact on our native populations and biodiversity. Um, so forest farming is a good way to help uh, alleviate some of that pressure and then bring more sustainably uh, cultivated and intentionally cultivated products to market. Uh, forest farming, you know, it can be a standalone management uh, strategy or it can be incorporated into a broader, more traditional forest management regime. Um, you know, forest farming can help support a variety of forest management goals. Um, some concepts that you might be familiar with or work with uh, in your daily life as a natural resource professional would be uh, timber stand improvement or crop tree uh, release. So timber stand improvements, um, you know, are most commonly associated with mid-story thinning. Um, so you're going to tend to get an accumulation of smaller diameter trees in the mid to understory, um, you know, it's a pretty common practice to help thin those, to uh, help help other hardwood species regenerate. Um, this can have benefits for forest farming as well. By removing those mid-story trees, you're helping to optimize the amount of light uh, that the plants can receive and that can accelerate their growth. Um, activities like vine control. So wild grapevines tend to uh, grow up with a tree as it, as it grows and can potentially, you know, cause damage to the tree crown, uh, causing the canopy or the, the upper branches or the crown to break or, and create canopy gaps. Um, so doing some basic things like vine control in your forest farming habitats, um, you know, very, can, can help improve the forest quality and help ensure that the habitat remains uh, stable and suitable for the non-timber forest product species that you might be cultivating in the understory. Um, invasive removal, also a very common timber stand improvement practice. Um, you know, invasive plants can uh, cause a lot of issues with competition or, uh, you know, pushing our desired, de desired species out of a, of a desired habitat. So a lot of times invasive control is a, is a precursor to any type of forest farming activity. Um, thinking about crop tree release, you know, looking at this picture here, we can see black cohosh, 
uh, you know, taking advantage of some extra light here on the forest edge and in this open understory. Now, obviously this is in a landscape. It's on the edge of somebody's yard. You can see the grass here, uh, but this kind of pattern does hold true um, in the forest interior as well. Um, so sometimes, you know, crop tree release is a practice where, um, you know, your best quality, largest canopy trees are freed up from competition to allow them to then produce more seed um, and allow more light to the forest floor. Um, so depending on the species that you're uh, cultivating, um, you know, they can respond really well to a little extra sunlight. Um, so if you're a crop tree release practice, um, could still create good habitat for certain species like black cohosh. Uh, golden seal tends to do pretty good with a little extra sunlight as well as pawpaws, which tend to fruit uh, the most heavily when they have access to, to good light. Um, at its core, you know, forest farming is a good way to help landowners get engaged in forest stewardship, um, you know, just get involved with uh, the care and management of their forest. They may, may never, you know, choose to do any type of, you know, timber stand improvement activity or anything like that. Um, but just the simple act of getting engaged with forest farming and steward some, stewarding some of these species uh, can have a lot of benefits to the, to the long-term health of the forest just by getting them actively engaged and uh, taking notice of what's going on in the forest, you know, helps them keep an eye out for potential problems pests, diseases, you know, all these types of things that can easily be overlooked if you're, if you're not really out there looking for them or, or being engaged in, in uh, caring for your forest. So now we're gonna talk about some of the forest, the basic forest farming methods. Um, you know, overall there's about three main cultivation methods that we'll talk about here today. Um, there's probably a few nuances um, between these three, um, depending on scale and intensity. Um, but generally speaking, the three methods would be what we call wild stewarded production, wild simulated production, and woods cultivated production. Um, now, all three of these, these methods tend to vary um, based on you know, the scale of production, uh, what the farmer's goal is going to be, um, what are the limitations of the site? You know, how steeply sloped is the terrain? Um, you know, how uh, thick or congested is the forest understory? You know, what plant species um, they're interested in growing? So we'll talk about all these uh, kind of nuanced characteristics of these three methods here in the, in the coming slides. So the wild stewarded method is, is, is basically, you know, as, as the name implies, you know, you're basically stewarding wild populations that are naturally occurring on the, pro on the property. Um, you know, many landowners have these, have some of these species already growing and they can just simply manage them sustainably for harvest and sale um, over, over a long-term period of time. Um, you know, the goal with wild, wild stewardship is to ensure the long-term viability of the population. You know, going back to the kind of the core uh, principles of forest farming, you know, sustainability and long-term uh, viability are, are kind of those core principles. And that's really important with wild stewarding, you know, because if you're just harvesting it all, essentially you're just wiping out wild populations, which is what we're trying to avoid. So some of the guiding principles for wild stewarded production um, you know, you're only harvesting mature seed bearing plants. That's going to ensure that you can replant those seeds at the time of harvest or that they've had time to disperse naturally before the plant is harvested. If you're going to be managing a wild population um, for commercial sale, always leaving a sufficient growing stock of, of good, healthy, mature plants is essential. You know, if we keep taking all the best individuals out of a population, the reproductive capacity of that population decreases. And then over time, you know, we're left with, uh, you know, less abundance and, uh, you know, a more impacted population. It's always important to replant and repropagate 
um, wild steward species every year, whether you're harvesting or not. Um, so for example, say you are stewarding a ramp population, um, you took this year off, you know, you didn't go out, you didn't harvest, you're still going to want to go out this fall, collect seeds, and then, you know, find a new area outside of the parent population or a new growing site and replant seeds there uh, to ensure that we're constantly, uh, you know, propagating new populations. Um, if, you can, if you can take a year off and, and just plant and not harvest, it's always a great way to help build up your growing stock and it'll be, um, you know, help, help uh, contribute to that long-term viability of your, of your populations. Um, you know, over time, you know, essentially, you know, wild stewarding um, can become what we're going to talk about next, which is a wild simulated uh, population or wild simulated uh, production system. Um, and we'll talk about the differences and how that simil and similarities here in just a second. Um, but really, if you're going to be wild stewarding, you have to really understand the species that you're working with. You have to understand how the uh, you know, the life cycle traits, how that plant grows, um, you know, what are some of its predators, what are some of its disease pressures, what are environmental factors that can, uh, you know, create stress in this population, um, you know, what are the, what's the reproductive capacity of the species, all these things are really important to ensure that you're going to be making good management decisions uh, when, when wild stewarding a population. Here's a picture of wild stewarded ramps. Um, you know, this is just a wild population. Um, you know, good distribution here in this picture. Um, you can see there's some areas back up here in the uh, corner where seed has been collected and planted and new little beds are forming. Um, you know, this is a great, a great example of a wild stewarded population. It doesn't look a whole lot different from a wild simulated population. Um, a little bit more geographically dispersed. You know, there's a lot more natural reproduction going here, natural seed dispersal, uh, you know, natural recruitment into the population. Um, you know, back here where it's a little bit thicker and a little more patchy, that's where seeds have been planted, um, you know, to create these new little uh, satellite populations. So wild simulated uh, production, is, you know, as the name implies, um, you know, you're trying to simulate wild conditions. You're trying to mimic the natural conditions these plants would naturally be found growing in. Um, talking about natural plant spacing, which is going to vary depending on the species that you're, that you're talking about. Um, you can grow either a single species in a wild simulated planting, or you could grow a couple different species. Um, you know, obviously, the more species diversity you have in a wild simulated planting, the more, uh, you know, truly, you know, wild it is, or you know, the more closely it's going to mimic those wild conditions. Um, wild simulated production is generally a middle to longish harvest cycle. Um, you know, it's going to vary by species, but generally speaking, we're looking at about a minimum of seven to 10 years. Um, before plants are really reproductively mature and you can start harvesting um, in any significant way. Um, you know, there are ways to do non-detrimental harvest, say for example, with ramps, you can harvest ramp leaf only, leaving the bulb in the ground to regenerate. Um, you could harvest your ginseng leaves instead of harvesting the root, you know, as these plants are maturing. Um, so yeah, there are a variety of strategies that can be used, but but overall, it's it's generally a seven to ten year cycle before um, any significant harvesting can can be done. Um, you know, wild simulated is a really great method because it's very low impact, very minimal soil disturbance. Um, you know, basically this picture that we're showing here, uh, the only tool that has been used on this site is a uh, two tools. There's a leaf rake and then a hard steel rake. Basically the leaf litter has just been raked off in strips and you know the top little eighth inch quarter inch of the soil has been uh, scuffed a little bit with a with a steel rake um, to just kind of loosen that top little bit of soil and improve the seed to 
seed to soil contact when you plant the seeds. Um, so very low impact, definitely less labor associated with wild simulated production. Um, you know, just less time in site preparation. Um, generally wild simulated populations tend to be more resistant to diseases. Um, so as, as far as having to, you know, come in and treat for diseases or manage, manage the impact of diseases, it's, it's not something that commonly have to do with wild simulated plantings. Definitely much more common with uh, woods cultivated plantings, which we'll talk about next. And ultimately, you know, wild simulated cultivation produces a root or roots that look truly wild. And for species uh, where the root appearance influences the value, you know, this is really important. So ginseng roots that look wild are more valuable than ginseng roots that look like carrots um, or like have really smooth texture to them. You know, so this method, it can be, you know, depending on what you're growing, you know, you wouldn't want to grow ginseng in a woods cultivated um, system per se. Um, if you're looking to get top dollar wild prices, you would typically try and grow them in a wild simulated setting so that root looks as close to wild as possible and then allows you to capture uh, full market value. Here's an example of wild simulated ginseng here in the forest understory. Uh, so the plants are standing out uh, really well right now at this time of year. It's taken in the fall of the year. And the plants are starting to turn yellow. Um, you can see, you know, it's ginseng plants scattered all throughout the forest understory here. Um, you know, you have maple seedlings in there, ash seedlings, uh, blackberry briars, you know, all different types of vegetation just gr growing in association with uh, each other, um, co-mingling. Um, so one of the big difference that you, differences that you could see is the level of uh, understory removal between certain production methods. So wild, uh, wild simulated and woods cultivated uh, production, we'll see a big difference between the understory, uh, you know, vegetative composition. Here's another wild simulated population. Um, this is taken early in the spring. You can tell it's early in the spring just because uh, the plants have not fully uh, leafed out yet. They're still a little bit smallish, still expanding. And they also have a really uh, bright green color. You know, it's early spring green. They haven't darkened up yet and got that deep green of, of later summer yet. Um, but here you can see the ginseng plants are just scattered all about. We have other species growing here. We have uh, some spice bush shrub over here in the left hand corner. We've got some uh, Christmas fern, sword fern over here in the right of the frame. Uh, violets. Um, here's a little rattlesnake fern over here in the in the right right of the frame as well. So just natural vegetation, um, you know, seeds are broadcast down. Um, just that first picture we looked at, leaf litter was raked back, seeds were broadcasted down at a certain rate. So we're having a nice even spacing here. That's something important to point out here with a uh, wild simulated planting. All the plants are fairly well spaced out. They're not really touching each other or growing all the, over each other. About one or maybe two plants per square foot. And that's a real natural spacing to find ginseng in. And so this is a good example of mimicking those natural wild conditions. Woods cultivated production, um, on the other hand, is a more, uh, relies more on, on moderate to heavy site modification to basically maximize as much growth uh, that you can get out of the roots that you're trying to grow. So generally speaking, competitive understory trees and shrubs are removed from the planting site. Uh, the soil can be shallowly tilled, generally, you know, three, maybe four inches, um, you know, of, of depth and then little and raised beds can be formed to help maybe create a little extra depth or facilitate uh, soil drainage. Um, you know, the removal of those understory, mid-story trees can optimize the light conditions and decrease shade. And then ultimately that's, that's helping to accelerate the growth of the plants. You know, the more light and the looser soil, 
allows those roots to really spread and, and grow a lot faster. In woods cultivated production, there's a lot more potential for disease to become an issue. Um, typically, you have denser plantings, generally speaking, lower species diversity. You know, woods cultivated production does tend to lend itself to a little bit more of a uh, monocropping uh, situation. So you have, you know, one full bed of golden seal or one full bed of cohosh, um, you know, rather than having, you know, all the other natural vegetation, like it growing in between the plants, like we saw with wild simulated production. Um, you know, this is a really good method for people who want to produce um, a lot of root stock, um, say planting stock for sale, and, you know, species that propagate asexually by, by root division. Um, so golden seal, black cohosh, bloodroot, Solomon seal, these are all species um, that grow as a rhizome that tend to, uh, you know, send out fibrous roots or little runners and and it can generally generate new plants uh, asexually rather than just from seed. So golden seal and black cohosh, I think, and bloodroot are three of the top, top tier candidates for woods cultivated production. Um, you know, certainly one of the main benefits of woods cultivated production, if as long as, you know, everything that can go wrong doesn't go wrong, is that you get higher potential yields. Um, and a shorter turnaround time on harvest cycles. So, you know, with wild simulated, we're growing plants seven to 10 years. Here with woods cultivated production, generally plants are ready to harvest and repropagate after about three or four years. So a uh, pretty significant decrease um, on harvest cycle time. Um, but as you know, we mentioned, much more significant potential for disease um, tilling of the soil, the, the more dominance of a single species, all these types of things can, can contribute to, to an environment that is more favorable for fungal pathogens. Here is a extremely blown up picture that's a little bit pixelated, do apologize for that, of a uh, woods cultivated golden seal bed. You can see here, this is a Pretty nice site, open understory. Doesn't really look like they've had to remove much in the way of, you know, competitive understory trees or shrubs. This is a naturally open site. And you know, so this is kind of ideal. Um, you know, if you had a very congested site with a lot of, you know, say spice bush or um, young trees growing, you know, it would require a lot of plant material to be removed before you could actually till this bed. Um, so keeping those kinds of considerations in mind are, is always good. Um, you know, the less site preparation, the better, in, in my opinion. Um, but you can see here, they've tilled this bed with a tractor or a small tiller. They've got their golden seal roots uh, spaced out in these little holes, generally about, you know, six to eight inches apart, rows six to eight in inches apart as well. And, uh, you know, this is pretty, Pretty good snapshot of what small scale woods cultivated production uh, would look like, you know. So you can get several beds like this in a forest stand and, and still be kind of in that small to medium sized wood cultivated uh, production system. Again, this would be, you know, small to medium sized type production. You'd see here basically all the forest understory is, has been removed or it was naturally open. Um, you can kind of see here in the background, there's a lot of rhododendron kind of growing on the forest edge. So, uh, you know, maybe there was a good bit of site clearing that happened on this site. I don't know the history of this site per se, so I can't really say. Um, but you can see the soil has been tilled and beds have been formed in between the trees here. And, you know, Golden Seal uh, is doing really well on this site. An example of large scale woods cultivated production. Here's uh, some woods cultivated ginseng. Um, I mentioned before, you know, ginseng is not a great candidate for this type of production, uh, mainly because it's susceptibility to disease. So to be able to grow ginseng in this type of, uh, this sized woods cultivated production does require a lot of inputs as far as fungicide applications to make sure the plants don't succumb to disease before uh, you know, the growing season's complete. 
you know, this is a good example. Um, you know, so we, we mentioned that woods cultivated plantings are really good for species that spread by rhizomes and, and spread asexually, like golden seal and black cohosh. Um, but it can also be very good for plants, um, you know, that rely on seed production. So, you know, that loose soil allowing the root to go, you know, like grow faster, get bigger, translates into, you know, more help, more vigorous plants and you get bigger berry clusters. So you could see just the sheer amount of, of, gins, of seeds that uh, these ginseng plants are producing. So, you know, if your goal is seed production, you know, woods cultivated uh, methodology could be, could be the right ticket for you. But it really just depends on what your goals are. And, um, you know, obviously this is a very flat site, very open site, um, you know, so this is pretty conducive to a, a larger scale uh, installation here. Now, if this was a heavily sloped site, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to use woods cultivated methods on a high, on a steeply sloped slope site that could contribute to, uh, you know, soil erosion or, or things of that nature. <sighs> so some basic site preparation and planting recommendations. Um, you know, species diversity is always beneficial. You know, if you have a variety of species within a single planting or natural vegetation between planting areas, you know, this helps, uh, you know, basically break things up, creates natural barriers or to, you know, disease spread, you know, diseases will spread across something that's much more uniform, uh, much faster than they'll spread through, you know, something that has structural diversity and, um, you know, species diversity. If you can avoid a large scale modification of a site, do so. I mean, the more you modify a site, uh, you know, the more potential for, um, you know, issues to occur. You know, if you're, um, for example, say uh, you're going to go in and try and create a big woods cultivated planting in a site that um, is filled with a lot of different species in the understory and you removed all that understory vegetation, um, you know, like we said before, that could just contribute to uh, disease spread and, and how, how fast that disease can move through your planting area. Also, you know, more modification means more labor. More labor means, uh, you know, more costs of your time invested, materials invested, and ultimately affects your bottom line. So, um, it's, it's generally something to avoid if possible. Um, always start small and, and get a few, some practice, gain some skills, and then go from there. Um, it'd be much more advantageous if you had an area that you wanted to plant, say it was highly congested in the understory, it'd be much better off to just open up the certain planting site that you wanted to utilize and then keep that natural vegetation between, between the different sites or, or planting beds. Um, personally, I like to use selective pruning or cutting um, rather than, you know, large scale modification. You could just selectively uh, remove whatever vegetation might be in your planting area. Um, you know, I would generally recommend to not use herbicides for this uh, purpose. Just use hand tools uh, and pruners. And, you know, you're probably gonna have to go back in after a couple years and maybe prune some prune some things back as, as they regrow. Um, but this is generally a much better approach, um, lighter on the land, um, well, much more subtle, you know, I mean, when you have sharp, drastic changes, uh, things can, can sometimes get a little bit wacky. So if you're doing more selective pruning and cutting, uh, I think the results are just as good um, and you avoid any potential you know, major, you know, shifts in the habitat, you know, and that's something that is always good to avoid if possible. It's always good to diversify the crop species, both within beds and between beds. For example, um, if you're doing a wild simulated planting of uh, ginseng, it could be good to uh, interplant with some golden seal, or it could be good to interplant with some black cohosh. You know, the benefits can be uh, numerous. So, for example, golden seal, highly antifungal. Um, it could help uh, 
keep disease from potentially spreading in your ginseng bed. Um, you know, black cohosh is a very tall statured plant compared to ginseng. It can offer some browse protection uh, from deer. You know, so the deer would uh, basically they could, you know, browse black cohosh before they get down to the ginseng. So there, there's a lot of different reasons to diversify, uh, you know, species both within and between beds. You know, disease control is one. Um, crop protection is another. It's always important to keep records as well. Um, keep records of your planting dates, um, you know, locations of your planting, what species you planted, how much area was planted, um, you know, any inputs that you use is in regards to, you know, soil fertilizers or, um, you know, mulches, um, you know, how much time you put in your labor, you know, how much expense is associated with your labor. Um, did you hire labor? All these things can be very helpful and informative uh, down the line when it's time to kind of evaluate how successful or profitable your forest farming venture has been. All right, let's try to talk a little bit about marketing forest farm crops. Obviously, marketing is the uh, end goal of most forest farming production. Um, you know, some people do it for just, just for a hobby. Um, but, you know, most people want to sell a product and they want to earn some potential income. So understanding the market dynamics is, is really important. Um, you know, so, so basically we have a couple different market uh, sectors here. You know, we have wholesale markets, um, direct markets, and value-added markets. And direct and value-added kind of can be interchangeable to a degree. Um, but here, starting with wholesale markets, you know, wholesale markets are generally very large volume, you know, plant material. This is generally for the bigger grower. Um, you know, material can be sold either fresh or dried, really just depends on uh, what the buyer uh, wants. Um, sometimes they like to dry the material themselves. Sometimes they like it already done and they're ready just to put in a storage room like we see here in this uh, picture. Wholesale markets tend to be, uh, you know, more of a lower price market. They tend to be um, lowest prices because it's the bottom of the value chain. If you think about, um, you know, selling herbs as a value chain, you know, the biggest buyers are buying it up as much volume as they can, as cheaply as they can, and then they resell it to somebody else. Maybe that somebody is gonna be a manufacturer could be a larger buyer or an aggregator who's then going to resell it again. Um, but ultimately, you know, there's a chain and every, every step in that value chain, you know, the price tends to increase a little bit. So when you're at the bottom of the value chain selling to a, a really big bar, buyer in large volumes, typically you're going to get, you know, pretty low prices. Um, wholesale markets can be pretty, pretty accessible. Um, you know, a lot of uh, what we call country buyers or local buyers um, are, are widely, widely available. Um, you know, for example, ginseng buyers um, will also be buying golden seal root, black cohosh root, all these types of things. And you can just go down, meet them on a Saturday, sell them your roots and you know, be on your way, get paid, be done with it. Um, most often this is associated with wild products um, that don't have a whole lot of overhead, you know, they can, so the, the harvester can afford to sell them at a lower price because they didn't invest, you know, 10 years in, in growing it, you know, per se. Um, you know, so if you are a forest farmer who is growing products, you really need to make sure that, that price point if you're going to be, you know, is there, if you're going to be accessing a wholesale market, um, you know, because you did invest the time and years in, in growing it. So you want to make sure that whatever price is being offered is actually, uh, you know, financially feasible for you. Direct markets, a um, couple different ways to think about this. We can think about, you know, selling direct to a manufacturer or a processor. Um, so for example, uh, a company like Gaia Herbs, you know, just throwing it out there as, a, as an example, or Mountain Rose Herbs, somebody who makes value-added products, like a 
extract or um, you know bag of tea leaf or you know ginseng tea leaf or or whatever it is you know um, as the grower if you can make a market connection and sell directly to that manufacturer start cutting out some of those middle brokers you're ultimately going to be you know capturing a higher price so you're selling higher up on the value chain um, you know this is takes a lot more work you know you have to develop those relationships you have to generally meet a lot of quality control standards um, you know, but it is potentially attainable. Um, so definitely more preparation on the grower's side um, and making those connections and preparing to make that sale. Um, but it can be uh, definitely more profitable than selling to just your local kind of wholesale buyer. Uh, selling direct to the consumer, obviously that's capturing full product value. You know, you're you grew the product, you know, go to your farmer's market, set up your booth, sell it, you know, capturing full retail price. Now, obviously that requires additional processing and investment on time of the grower. You have to, you know, in some cases you have to dry the plant material before you can turn it into a value added product. Uh, you have to package it. You have to spend the time to market it. You know, so there are, there are definitely uh, extra requirements on behalf of the grower, but, um, Ultimately, the payout is there and it allows you to capture that full product value. You know, value added products tends to fall into, you know, this gray area, you know, similar to, um, you know, direct consumer marketing. Um, I think the main distinction is really the processing and manufacturing of a raw ingredient into uh, a secondary product. So selling direct to consumer um, in our previous slide there, say, you grew some golden seal roots, you dried them, you're selling them as dried golden seal roots directly to the consumer at your farmer's market. You know, that's a direct consumer sale. There's really not been a value add in regards to processing. So if you took that golden seal root and then turned it into a salve, like this golden salve that we have here pictured on this slide, you know, that would be a value add. You're taking, you know, one ounce of, you know, golden seal root that's valued at, you know, $20 and turned it into, you know, $150 worth of salve. I'm just making up numbers here, but, you know, this is an example. I mean, that's, that's kind of where the, the nuance between direct consumer sales and value added sales, um, value added products kind of tends to be, I mean, you could certainly sell value added products, you know, to a, a distributor, a wholesaler. I mean, so once you get into these other markets, you know, I mean, they could break down into different segments as well. Um, but overall, value added products, if you're selling them directly to a consumer, it allows that grower to, uh, you know, capture that full product value. And again, they have to, you know, process, package, and, and market those products. Um, there are other ways to add value to products without additional processing. So you don't necessarily have to turn your golden seal roots into a golden seal salve, um, but there are, you know, grower certifications that can add value as well. Um, you know, most people are, uh, are familiar with certified organic. Um, so if you're, get your golden seal beds certified organic, um, you basically get a price premium for that root. You know, it might be $30 for regular golden seal, you might get $60 for certified organic, you know, per pound or whatever, whatever the uh, increment is. So there are, there are ways to add value through certification. Uh, Forest Grown Verified is the FGV program um, operated by United Plant Savers. This is another way to help, uh, you know, growers verify that they grew this product. It's not, you know, co-mingled with wild product and uh, can you know, help them uh, capture that additional value. So those are some, some more nuanced, uh, newer ways to uh, add value that are becoming more commonplace in the uh, forest farming community. All in all, you know, forest farming, it's a long-term strategy. It's not a get-rich-quick scheme by any means. Um, you know, generally we're looking at 10 to 20 plus years of, of potential time investment in, in farming these products. Um, you know, for natural resource professionals, 
it's a great way to engage landowners and forest stewardship and forest management. Um, it's important for prospective growers to understand really what it takes to uh, get good results. I mean, it takes investments of time, labor, money. Um, it's, as, as I mentioned before, not a get rich quick enterprise, but certainly is a good way to earn some potential income um, as long as, you know, all that can go wrong doesn't, you know, even successful growers have periodic failures uh, from time to time, um, you know, or this is you know, growing plants in a dynamic forest ecosystem, you know, there are diseases, there are predators, you know, there are human poachers, you know, things can arise, but there is definite potential for earning a supplemental income uh, by producing these plants. Um, as a consultant or natural resource professional who's helping a landowner get started, um, it's important that they, uh, sorry. It's important that they get some skills before they go big. Apologize for the interruption there. Um, you know, it's kind of like the crawl, walk, run, you know, analogy, you know, you got to crawl before you can walk, you got to walk before you can run. So, you know, don't start by uh, trying to plant 20 acres of ginseng, you know, start by planting a couple pounds, scattering a couple sites across a couple acres, see how it goes, you know, get some skills first and then work up from there. Um, it's also important to grow plants that make sense. Um, you know, plants that are well suited to the site, you know, they're site appropriate, growing plants that are in demand um, and have high value, you know, for example, here in uh, Ohio, we're a little bit outside the range of a popular species uh, commonly referred to as false unicorn root. Um, it grows more commonly down in the southern Appalachians, uh, but I was out working with a grower. They wanted to grow false unicorn root. They were buying hundreds of roots every year, planting them. They were all dying. It was a bad site. It was very wet, um, you know, poorly drained soil. And we were outside of the native range, you know. So it's not a species. It was really site appropriate. Um, and it didn't make a lot of sense for him to keep trying to grow that. Um, despite it being a high demand and relatively high value plant, you know. So demand and value don't always, uh, you know, don't always drive success, you know. So there are a lot of factors to consider, um, but definitely growing stuff that makes sense for the sites that you have available. Um, you know, you don't want to get into a situation where you're trying to really modify a site to become suitable for a certain species. Um, it would often make much more sense to grow a species that's already, you know, suited to that site per se. Um, couple resources here for growers um, that you can share with your landowner clients. The Forest Farming YouTube channel is always a great resource. Um, this is a series of videos put together by the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmers Coalition. You just go on YouTube, type in forest farming, the forest farming channel will come up. Um, be everything you know from ginseng, golden seal, maple syrup, mushrooms, um, a whole variety of uh, forest farmed crops, um, tutorial videos there. Uh, the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmers website, it's also a great source of information. Um, as far as books go and, and reference books to, uh, that growers can have and hold on to and refer to over the years that they might be uh, experimenting with this type of production. Uh, Scott Persons and Janine Davis's book, Growing and Marketing Ginseng, Golden Seal and Other Woodland Medicinals, is considered uh, to be one of the premier resources out there. It's um, in its second edition right now. Um, can't say enough good things about that book. It covers pretty much all the species um, that any forest farmer uh, could be interested um, in producing. And then there's also a free resource if anybody's interested in receiving free PDF copies um, last year about two years ago, United Plant Savers and Rural Action uh, wrote a book called The Forest Farmer's Handbook, um, A Beginner's Guide to Growing and Marketing At-Risk Herbs. Um, if anybody's interested in getting a copy of that, they can feel free to email me 
at tanner at ruralaction.org. Or you can also email andrea at ruralaction.org and we'll send you over a PDF copy of that resource. Um, you know, covers cultivation of probably the top five, you know, species, uh, ginseng, golden seal, black cohosh, ramps, bloodroot. Um, talks a lot about site selection and evaluation, um, site preparation, different production methods. Uh, basically, it would be a good accompanying resource to the presentation uh, that you just listened to. And uh, also available on Amazon if anybody wants to purchase a hard copy that is available on amazon.com. Um, never hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions about anything that we covered here in this presentation today or just you know, general inquiries, uh, feel free to reach out to us at Rural Action or any of the partners uh, within the West Virginia Forest Farming Initiative, um, you know, U Mountain Center, Appalachian Sustainable Development, United Plant Savers. Um, we're all part of the WVFFI and we're all out here to help assist you if needed. So don't hesitate to track us down.